Glory 32 was in Norfolk, Virginia on Friday, July 22nd, featuring a very excellent card. Starting first with the Super Fight Series, exclusively shown on the UFC Fight Pass. It was kicked off with a special military bout as uh, Smith and Corbin represented the Air Force and the Navy, respectively. So it was a special two-minute round fight, three rounds uh, conducted here. And while these guys probably won't continue on with glory, it was still pretty cool to see the military represented, especially in Virginia, where, of course, uh, Annapolis is uh, not too far away there in Maryland. There are also naval bases, I believe, uh, that part of the coast of Virginia. Maybe I'm wrong on that. But uh, definitely, of course, not that far from Washington, D.C. as well. So it was cool uh, to have that and kind of a cool thing for the fans there in uh, Virginia that were in attendance to see that. And uh, for Smith, uh, he had a very good uh, performance there, uh, Cedric Smith. Definitely, you could tell, was an actual kickboxer. No offense to Corbin, but I think probably hadn't done too much training uh, in kickboxing, that being Roger Corbin. And Cedric definitely won the first two rounds. He was uh, really, he was he's being the bigger and taller guy. He did a good job of staying away from uh, the power punches there of the much shorter um, Roger Corbin. And also, like I said, you could tell was a kickboxer, uh, was able to throw uh, a few kicks um, the way of Corbin, who didn't really seem at, but I think I remember thro seeing him throw like one kick the whole entire fight. So, uh, the third round, though, I think Cedric, a little tired, and the forward pressure of Corbin, uh, I think, took him that third round, but it was kind of a little too late there uh, for Corbin as Cedric Smith was able to uh, come away with the victory there to kick off the Super Fight Series portion of the card. Uh, and then it got pretty exciting for the rest of the card, really, uh, as far as the Super Fight Series goes, as uh, Giga Chikazi taking on... Uh, Mulseri there in the featherweight division and of course uh, Giga is coming off an excellent performance there at Glory 27 as Chris uh, Mossery was making his Glory debut against one of the top 10 fighters in the featherweight division that was going to be a very tough task for him and Giga has really been uh, on a roll since his loss to Anvar uh, Boy Nazarov back at Glory 23 winning his last two fights at least within uh, Glory having that, like I said, that excellent fight against Van Nostrand at Glory 27. And you could just tell that Giga is at another level than uh, Masseria. I think that Chris may have a bright future, but right now uh, Giga is one of the best fighters in the world uh, in this weight class. And with the pending featherweight tournament, uh, which I'll get to in a little bit, coming at Glory 33 in New Jersey, Friday, September 9th, I would think Giga is a shoo-in for a spot in that tournament. I think he is deserving of possibly a title shot, realistically, considering some of the top guys have already uh, faltered uh, against not only Adam Chuck, um, but guys like uh, Amzrami and, and Varga, who's now the champion as well. So I think uh, Giga is a shoo-in for that uh, tournament. I'll talk more about that uh, later, of course, with the featherweight title being defended here at Glory 32, but I think Giga just dominant, and then that kick that he landed there against Chris was just absolute nasty, and you could tell once that kick landed, he, he was done. There was, well, I mean, they started the count, but you could just tell he was not going to get up, and uh, very impressive performance by Giga, I think probably his most impressive so far inside the Glory ring. Coming up next, uh, Francis uh, Ambang took on Michael Stevens in about in the welterweight division. Um, being uh, one of the veterans here in Glory, uh, Francois rather, I said Francis, Francois is what I meant. Uh, he's been fighting for Glory since almost the beginning there at Glory 9. And this fight, he definitely was the favorite. Uh, Michael Stevens had never fought in Glory before, only fought 14 times professionally to, you know, looking at Francois who's fought, uh, well actually they're about the same amount of fight, but Fighting in glory since Glory 9 has definitely um, has fought the high-level competition. And I thought Francois was really good in rounds 1 and 2. You could tell Stevens, very raw, does have potential. I mean, he could take a punch. I think that's definitely there. But you could tell not quite at the level of Ambang. And then in round 3, 
it seemed like Francois really slowed down. I don't know if it was the forward pressure of Stevens, you know, constantly backpelling, was the fact that Ambang threw a lot of shots and Stevens still refused, you know, to go down maybe. But I thought a very sloppy third round by Francois. He's lucky I think Stevens just really isn't that good. And also coupled in with eating all those shots he did in the first six minutes of the fight, I think it was going to be hard for him, even with a now fatigued Francois, to find a finish. And so Ambe gets the victory, but not very impressive in my opinion. I thought he was a lot better back at Glory 30 in that welterweight uh, contender tournament in both rounds, really, even going against the final there against Richard Abraham. I thought that was a very close fight. So I thought Stevens is a guy he should have beat pretty easily and ended up struggling. So I think before he gets into any sort of future title contender tournament or guys in the top 10, you know, higher up the top 10, I think he's going to need a, another lower ranked guy because I was not really impressed with his victory here uh, against Stevens. And for Stevens, he's really just got to work on that technique. I mean, he has the part of taking a punch down that uh, I feel like he definitely has, but he's definitely got to work on that technique, really protect his head more. And yeah, his forward movement is good, but you got to be able to uh, counter, see shots coming, and, and cover up a little more. You can't just simply walk through shots and expect that to go well in your career. I mean, Francois Ambang is a very skilled fighter, and if you're going to want to fight guys as good as him or even better, you can't just simply walk through punches. You're going to have to learn some defense and countering. The next fight of the evening was part of Glory's Super bantamweight women's tournament to crown glory's first ever female champion and in this fight you had funda icalis as she took on vanessa dewall and i didn't really see much from vanessa really other than that first about minute minute 30 of round one she then took a very hard hit from funda and that's when i think you started to see the blood start trickling down Vanessa's face and really from that point on I noticed a very defensive kind of shelled fighter there in uh, the Belgium fighter Vanessa and it didn't really seem like she was able to recover I mean she landed a few shots here and there but it seemed like Funda had this fight under control she was landing some really nice uh, you know sweet chin music so to speak there uh, especially in round three that uh, sidekick to the head countering well all the big impact strikes were from funda um and vanessa to me just couldn't really recover after that first uh minute and a half of having the fight go her way and i wouldn't say it was an old i'll put it this way she won this fight she definitely was the better fighter but i wouldn't say this was an overly dominant performance by funda i think we've seen i've seen better performances so far in this tournament however I do think the good thing for her is she got out of this fight relatively unscathed, which in a long tournament format like this is a big deal. And she arguably is the most experienced fighter in this tournament. I mean, 29-2 overall career record. So I think that she will be a force to be reckoned with here in the, in the second round. And besides, of course, Tiffany Timebomb, I would consider Funda a very likely candidate to win this thing. And wasn't too surprised by her performance considering that Vanessa hasn't done much overall professional kickboxing. So I think Funda uh, will be good. I'm excited for the next uh, matchup. I believe it will be the last quarterfinal uh, here for the bantamweight tournament, uh, super bantamweight tournament, as Zoya Frostal uh, will be taking on Daniela Graf, and that will be at glory 33 as part of the super fight series so i'm not quite sure how the bracket will go moving forward after this i don't know if they're just going to pick the be best matchups or what but that should be a very good uh scrap and i'm really interested in that and of course uh, as fans may remember we tried to have zola on about a month ago so i'm going to retry to get that interview here in the next couple weeks to talk to her now that she officially uh has her fight day i think she knew her opponent there in graph but wasn't sure when that was going to take place so um, very interested in seeing this tournament progress. So far, it's been all right. I, I don't think anyone's been, you know, there hasn't been anything too crazy uh, happening, but uh, Funda definitely won that fight.
the next fight here, the Super Fight Series, uh, Anderson Silva uh, took on uh, Haput um, in a matchup in the heavyweight division. And for Gordon Haput, uh, coming out of uh, Germany, he had never fought in glory before. Solid record coming into the fight at 20-7. and seven. He was going to have a tough task trying to take on a guy like Anderson Silva, currently ranked number five in the world according to Glory's rankings, and has been fighting for Glory and other top-level organizations for a very long time, compiling a record of 40 and 14, one draw. And for Silva, he had a great performance against Maurice Green at Glory 27 that ended a two fight losing streak inside of Glory losing to the likes of Errol Zimmerman who is one of the best uh, to compete and Jamal Ben Sadiq and that's coming off of you know at, at the time you can make a case maybe his biggest victory defeating Sergei Karatanov at Glory 16 back to back losses come back to defeat Maurice Green then as part of the tournament there at Glory 29 for a heavyweight title shot he had a good opening round against Ismail Lamp but then looked really bad in the final two rounds as Lant was really able to take over uh, definitely dominated those last two rounds to get the victory so for Silva against a to most glory fans a relatively unknown in Gordon Haput he kind of needed a good performance to me to reestablish himself in the top 10 of glory's rankings and he just he did that uh, pretty emphatically as very reminiscent of earlier in the night with uh, Giga Chikazi just a great body kick there by Haput, and he just went down. And he kind of went into the corner and kind of slid down and a little bit of a delayed reaction, but you could tell after that kick that he was not going to be able to continue. Uh, and so it goes down as a first-round knockout there for Braddock Silva, who now runs his glory record even at 6-6. Six and six. And after the fight, ends up getting himself a shot at heavyweight champion Rico Verhoeven. That's going to be at Glory 33, September 9th in New Jersey, and it will serve as the main event on the ESPN uh, portion of the card. Also added a Simon Marcus against uh, Jason Wilness will be serving as the main event for the Super Fight Series. And for Silva, a little surprising that he gets the title shot, in my opinion. Now, I know he's been in Glory for a long time, pretty much since the beginning. Glory 2, his first ever Glory fight against Remy Bojanski. And... While he's been around for a long time, he's fought some of the best, he's beaten some of the best. The fact that Ismail Lant has a guaranteed title shot, he's already earned it. The fact that he beat Anderson Silva and beat him pretty handily, in my opinion. Also, if you add in the fact that Chai Lewis Perry, who we'll get to in just a moment, the main event of the Super Fight Series for Glory 32, he actually knocked out Murray's screen, where Anderson Silva just simply won by decision. So, a little bit surprising to me now as far as I know Ismail Lant is not hurt it's possibly a timing thing maybe Lant wouldn't have been ready to go for September I'm not sure but considering at least for glory he lost last fought at glory 29 I know that was a tournament but you think Lant would be good to go and would want a shot at Rico Verhoeven, the shot that he deserves, the shot that he earned by winning that tournament, fighting six rounds in one night. So it's a little unnerving, but if it's if Lon, as far as I know, seems to be okay with it, it seems to be like a timing sort of thing. He just wouldn't have been ready to go. He might have had other commitments, or maybe he did suffer uh, some injuries in that uh, tournament victory. So Anderson Silva gets the shot. He finally gets a shot at the Glory Heavyweight Championship, and he's taking on Rico Verhoeven. Good luck to him. Verhoeven's been awfully dominant. And for Lant and for other contenders in the heavyweight division, Rico Verhoeven already has his next fight booked, as he will now be taking on Badr Hari, a former K1 standout champion, tournament runner-up, all that good stuff. Uh, he hasn't fought in a year, but definitely... At one time, you can make a case he was the best kick, uh, kickboxer on the planet. Now taking on a guy who was arguably considered the best kickboxer in the planet, Enrico Verhoeven. So it's a matchup everybody has seemed to want it for really the past year. Really, I think it started kind of up early this year with uh, Verhoeven dominating people the way he has. That, you know, well, he hasn't beaten any. He's beaten some people, but nobody nobody like Bader Hari and it. Kind of started swirling and materializing, and Botter was at the uh, last couple of glory events they had over in Europe, and fans wanted it, started 
circulating and whatnot. Would it happen? Would it be for a long-term contract? Would it be a one-off? Would it be for the heavyweight title? But it's going to happen, and they're calling it Glory Collision. They're going to meet in September. No official date and or city or venue or ticket information has been released, but it will happen in December. The only thing I don't like about Rico fighting Badahari is the fact that he still has to fight Anderson Silva in September. And as far as Rico goes, yeah, he's come out with most of his fights relatively unscathed, but it just takes one wrong movement, one wrong kick placement uh, for him to be hurt and ruin this huge super fight that can garner glory a lot of attention and a lot of dollars. So I don't like it from that aspect. I think they should have kept it somewhat hidden, like, yeah, he's going to fight Bader in December, but he has to get through his title defense in September 1st. So I think that could be a mistake. I've never been a fan of booking a fight before you have another fight booked. I don't I don't really like that. Hopefully it works out because I do want to see Rico against Bader, but uh, this could, could end up being disastrous. It really could. So while I hope it uh, goes well, we'll see how Rico does against Anderson Silva. And that will bring me to my point here against uh, Chai Lewis Perry, who uh, in just a minute I'll chat with. He had a great performance against Maurice Green. Like I said, when you compare Anderson Silva's win, yeah, dominant against Maurice Green, but Perry was able to do what Silva couldn't, and that's put away Maurice Green, and he did in the second round. And his first glory fight in uh, quite a while, as uh, he last competed for glory, it was a victory. Uh, that was last year back at... Uh, Actually, his last victory for Glory was back in May of 2015. His last fight was actually his first ever loss uh, in kickboxing, losing to Xavier Vigny at Glory 21 San Diego. That was part of a tournament. And for his fight against Maurice Green, you'll hear in the interview as well, he definitely wanted to get some work into something he wanted. He didn't just want to put Green away in 20 seconds like his uh, Glory debut there at Glory 20 against Park Young Soo. So... He was able to get some work time. He was able to avoid most of the big power shots. He was able to show his conditioning, show that despite the long layoff, you know, he's still in the prime of his career and a guy that is dangerous against anybody in this glory heavyweight division, especially when you add in his height there at 6'9". And I think for Green, he's still kind of remind me of that Stanley fight uh, earlier against Francois. Yeah, he's tough. He has some power, but he doesn't quite still have the technique down, and Lewis Perry has that technique down. He was pretty much able to see everything Maurice was throwing at him and was able to handle it with relatively ease and was able to finally land a nasty uh, right uppercut and then kind of a left pushing hook that sent Green crashing to the canvas, and uh, that was it there in the second round. And um, We'll get to the main card uh, here in just a minute, but definitely made a strong case for early knockout of the night as Glory added bonus awards for the first ever time for their events, adding a knockout and fighter of the night bonus of $5,000 each if you are able to win one of those awards. And great comeback performance. I think Chai has earned himself a matchup against a top 10 ranked heavyweight for his next fight. Has some... Uh, very colorful comments for heavyweight champion Rico Verhoeven after the fight as well. And um, in my interview, I'll get to momentary with him. He was uh, he named out a few uh, a few opponents he would like, and uh, possibly uh, a guy he would like to go at again would be Xavier Vigny, another very tall and uh, athletic heavyweight. So I think that would be a tremendous fight uh, if that happens next. So, uh, without further ado, here's my interview with Chopper Chai Lewis Perry. Jim Graham here for Beyond the Cage. Now joining me on the line, I have a special guest. He was in the main event of the Glory 32 Super Fight Series. He is the chopper, Chai Lewis Perry. And Chai, thanks for joining me here on Beyond the Cage. What's up, what's up, what's up? Thanks for having me, man. It's a pleasure. Coming into this fight, Chai, in all your preparation uh, for your matchup against Maurice Green, what did you expect from him once you stepped inside the ring? Um, do you know what? I have a lot of respect for Maurice because he's, he's a tough dude at the end of the day. Um, I knew my, my skill set um, versus his was worlds apart, but um, I always respect the guy that I'm facing. You know, um, at the end of the day, they're, they're athletes at the, the upper echelon of, of um, combat sports, and uh, 
uh, I just knew that that he was gonna gonna always put pressure. He was gonna put pressure, and he was gonna come to fight, and it, it wasn't gonna be easy to put him away, you know. Um, so so yeah, I, I guess what he bring um, to the fight um, was uh, was what I expected, to be quite honest with you. Did he surprise you with anything in this match? Uh, not at all, no. To be honest with you, um, I wasn't surprised. I wasn't. Uh, I wasn't bewildered. I wasn't shocked. I wasn't anything. I didn't. I didn't really have anything because I knew. I knew how focused I was and how prepared I was. I was very well prepared for this fight. I felt great. And um, the, the 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 best asset I, I feel that I have is is probably my mindset. You know, whenever whenever I prepare for a fight, I always make sure I do the the best I can so that I don't I don't leave any stone unturned. And I I turned over all the stones, all the pebbles, all the rocks for this one. And uh, there was nothing he could do. There was absolutely nothing he could do to, to win that fight and take that victory away from me. In round number two, it seemed like Maurice started to slow down a bit. He was uh, ducking his head a lot, trying to land a lot of power overhands against you. And was it pretty easy at that point to step aside, counter, and land that uppercut like you did the one that actually put him away? Well, I mean, as I said, you know, I've said this many times before, you know, I'm very confident in my power. Like, I know that um, uh, for a heavyweight, you know, a lot of heavyweights, they're big and they just hit hard because they're big. They don't even hit hard, they hit heavy. And, um, you know, I'm I'm a very quick heavyweight, so I know that my power can put anybody down if I land it. Um, And I I believe there was a moment in the the first round where I could have finished the fight, but, you know, I've had had, um, over a year off and, uh, you know, not through choices of my own, but I've, a year has been taken from me in this sport. And I wanted some ring time. Like, it was important for me to get some ring time. Um, and I'm, I'm glad it, we got to the second. But I knew, I knew conditioning would be a factor for him and not for me. So um, it was good to, the second round, you know, be able to keep the pressure on him and really test my, my um, cardio conditioning and, and my pace. So, you know, at the end of, at the end of it all, um, apart from the victory, I learned a lot about myself. Um, in terms of where I am right now and uh, where I need to go to improve even further. Now, of course, uh, with your victory, you were probably uh, a contender at that point to win the one of the bonuses that Glory just announced, uh, Fighter of the Night as well as Knockout of the Night. And then uh, later on, you had uh, Hammer Lane with his first round uh, knockout there in just 20 seconds over Thompson in the light heavyweight tournament. Um, he did get that award, but uh, do you think that was the the right choice, or are you do you still think your uppercut was good enough? No, I mean, yeah, his his knockout was good. The crowd loved it. It was fast, um, so I can agree with the the knockout of the night one. But I don't agree with the fighter of the night because the first the first fight he just landed. You know, he he landed that quick punch in the first exchange. It wasn't a fight. The second fight he stopped his guy, but his performance wasn't better than my performance. So I'm happy for him, you know. I'm happy for any fighter that gets the bonuses because, I'm, you know, it's not uh, we're not all um, walking around with Donald Trump money. So uh, these, these bonuses help our, our individual lives. But um, I definitely could have got a fighter of the night because, you know, I always put on a show, um, win or lose in a fight, I go out there to, to fight, you know, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm on my shield and I'm ready to do whatever. So I definitely feel like I won that one, fighter of the night, but uh, I guess, you know. The powers that be saw differently, so it's whatever. It doesn't matter. It's only it's only it's only five grand. That's all I'm gonna say. It's only five grand. I'll, I can um I can dig some holes and make five grand in a month. So ain't no biggie. Do you feel like these bonuses are kind of like a long time coming? Is it? Are you glad that they're finally uh, something like this is instituted for glory? Oh, definitely. Yeah. I mean, if we're gonna backdate, then I'm owed. I owed two bonuses before for the knockout because I definitely got knockout of the night in Dubai, and I definitely got knockout of the night in um, in San Diego. So maybe we can, maybe I'll reach out to the guys and try and backdate it. Um, but yeah, I think I think um, it's it's it, the fighters should should be rewarded. You know, they're not. It's not like they're big, huge, out of pocket rewards. It's just a nice little liner for guys because we do put a lot of a lot of time in. Every professional athlete puts in the time 
Um, you know, how many hours, how many man hours go into preparing for a fight that lasts maximum of nine minutes? You know, it's insane. Um, so those little rewards, they help. It helps with the, it helps you have a really good uh, layoff and, and, you know, with kickboxing, a lot of guys just turn around and fight again straight away. When they do have that week off, two weeks off or whatever, they can have a, have a really nice holiday with the family, you know? Now, since uh, your layoff, this is the first time you've competed for glory since uh, the new Fight Pass deal is in place. Of course, your fight headline, the Fight Pass portion. Uh, what do you think about the deal with glory uh, being shown on Fight Pass for the Super Fight Series? I think it's brilliant, you know. Um, obviously, the the audience that the UFC has is um, is is gargantuan on a global scale, and um, it's what the sport needs. Because you know, kickboxing back in the day when you had um, K1, uh, I mean, it was insane. The sport was insane, and right now we're you know it's it's on a better global stage um, with a, with a wider audience and more educated audience. So Fight Pass is just going to help help Glory um, skyrocket, I think. I think you're going to see some, some amazing things with Glory and, and the development of its athletes as well because, like I say, kickboxing is, is one of the most exciting sports you could watch. It's nonstop action, especially the, the K1 Glory rules. Uh, so you're going to see spectacular finishes. And you're going to see, I mean, they're going, they're going to have to be devastating because of these 10-ounce gloves and not these 4-ounce ones. With the ten ounce gloves, you know guys are really putting in work and they're hitting hard. They must be hitting hard to be to be knocking guys out with those gloves on. So um I, I think nothing but, but uh good can come from the, the, the fight pass deal. Now, of course, uh, after the fight, uh, you called out Rico Verhoeven, and I think with your performance overall in glory, not just uh, your win there over Green, I think he had a strong case for a possible shot at the glory heavyweight champion. And afterwards, uh, you find out that Anderson Silva, another guy on the card, gets the title shot uh, over Ismail Lott, who already has a secured title shot. And also, they already booked Rico for another fight in December, taking on uh, Badr Hari. Is that... Is that crazy that you go from possibly getting a shot at the champion now the champion's booked for the you know the next six months uh, with two fights? You know what? It's business at the end of the day, isn't it? You know, uh, the one thing I cannot argue is Anderson Silva. Uh, I can't argue with that at all. I'd love to step in if if there was a, an injury. You know, if Anderson couldn't make the fight or whatever, I'd I'd, I'd take that last minute. But at the end of the day. <clears throat> The biggest thing for me is is I love to entertain. So this is a sport. Of course, I'd want to be the champion, um, but I wouldn't want to be the champion in boring fashion, you know, and just, oh, he eked out this, and he got a decision, and he point, out-pointed the guy. It's like the people, it's like the, 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 the gladiators, you know. Those guys went out there, they fought for their life, and the crowd was loving it. So I, I believe because of my... Um, my abilities, regardless of my, my my rankings, where I am in the rankings, that don't mean nothing. Uh, where I am in terms of experience, that means absolutely zilch also. But my style and my ability will present a problem for anybody. All I have to do is land one, and that's going to happen. One is going to get landed. So Rico could very well lose his belt to the, the, the guy that he's fought with the least experience. And, and uh, he knows that, you know. I think everybody knows that at the end of the day. So um, I'm, I, I, I feel as a package, you know, I'd, I'd sell that fight really well. It'd be, it'd be fantastic, um, and it'd be fun, you know. And it'd be making history as well because the Brit hasn't fought for a title in glory. So uh, I'll be putting uh, England on the map. Uh, England slowly on the rise, you know. They've been, they've been creeping up, you know. They make, they've, they've got a champion Bellator, a champion of UFC. And now we get a champion glory. That'd be that'd be a, a nice on the cake there. So I'm I'm just I'm game for whatever. I don't see what the point in being in this in this organisation if you're not going to call out the champ. People say, oh, you're not ready to fight somebody else. Why? If I can fight the champ now, why don't I fight the champ now? And then I'll fight the other guys if I lose, but or, or when they get a defence, you know. Uh, but I don't, I don't understand that when people say, no, you're not ready to fight the champ. So, well, I'm here. I'm willing to do it, so why not do it? You know? No, I was saying it's just it just it makes me laugh. It's funny. It, these guys they talk about um, 
other fighters talk about, oh, you get experience and blah, blah, blah. It's like, well, it'd be my mistake. If I go in there and I lost the fight and I wasn't ready, then that's my mistake. But I'm willing to take that gamble. So don't worry about me. Just worry about yourselves and your career. You build your career. I'm, I'm, I'm here to take out the head guy because I believe I can do it. And, and that's it, you know. What do you think about the matchup against Rico and Bader? Obviously, it's been a while since he has competed. Many say that he may be past his prime, but what do you think about that potential non-title uh, super fight happening in December? I think that's that's a brilliant fight. I mean, it's 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 like the the, the circus fights that everyone you know. You go to the circus and you go watch two got two giants fight. Um, it's a it's a spectacle for the fans. That's a real fans. That's a fighters fans fight, you know, the the guys that are fighters and, and they're fans of the sport also, but I think that's, um, it'll be fun to see, I don't know, do you know, it's hard to see how how I call that fight, I want to say Butter, because Butter is just a, is the beast, he's a very big man, he's powerful, he doesn't throw anything light, he only throws power, you know, Rico is very, he's very technical, um, but I can just see, you know, the, the Butter style which uh, I can relate to more than I can Rico style. I can just see that being a problem for Rico. His his matchup, the way that he works, the way that his his um technical approach. Like I say, but just has to land one one of those wild shots, and it's a wrap. So I think I'd go with Butter in that fight. To be honest with you. If Bader sticks around for more than just the Rico fight, win or lose, is that a fight that if you could take that you would take? Absolutely. Of course, you know, you're talking about one of the best ever to to compete in um in K one. So yeah, absolutely. What would be an ideal world is uh, is I get Rico, I take his belt and then Bada challenges me for the belt. That'd be that'd be the ideal world, wouldn't it? Because then it's just some gold, you know, you're putting it putting your name on the map. So yeah. I, like I said, I'm only, to be completely honest with you, I'm only interested in the bigger names as opposed to the little, the, the smaller names. You know, there's plenty of guys that are talented that have got good names, but I'm I'm much more interested in the bigger names because there's there's more at stake, there's more at stake, more risk, more reward. Now, who would you like for your next fight, Chai? Um, so it's not going to be Rico. <laughs> Uh, I'd love to get that, that monkey off my back and get that rematch with Vigny. I would love to just get that one and bury that one. Um, I always like to fight uh, an idea of fighting Hedley Gurgis. Oh, I like Hedley's style. You know, he's a big dude. Kind of looks like me. It'd be weird if like fighting fighting my reflection. So, uh, yeah, I've always liked that fight. But, yeah, I think Vigny is just some, someone that I need to... I need to get back. I, I owe him. I owe him one. Now, besides kickboxing, you have also done some mixed martial arts, compiling an undefeated record in MMA as well, 6-0 and with the no contest. Uh, your last fight was back in July of 2014. Is there any immediate plans to do another MMA match, or are you sticking with uh, kickboxing for right now? Um, right now, I'm I'm just gonna I'm gonna see how the rest of the year plays out with with Glory, um, but there is there's no immediate plans to, for MMA. But MMA is definitely something I'll be doing again next year. I know for sure next year. Uh, I don't know about this year, but for sure next year I'll be back in the cage somewhere. I don't know where yet, but um, there's been there's been some uh, some interesting offers, and um, let's just say that they're interesting. And uh, we'll see. But right now, I just you know, I want to. I think I've finally been able to to continue my career, which was put on hold for so long. Um, and I'm I'm just happy to sort to be to be back on the back on the wagon and 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 get some more fights under my belt. You know. As people know, you do most of your training there in San Jose at the American Kickboxing Academy, and one of the guys you trains with, of course, is former heavyweight champion Cain Velasquez. And in his last fight against Travis Brown, he threw a couple of pretty good spinning back kicks uh, to the head there of Travis Brown. And I was wondering when Cain busted those out, were those some moves that you taught him there, those spinning back kicks? Well, let me just say Cain is a bad, bad man. 
<laughs> that guy is um he he's very <clears throat> deceptive in his style and um you never know what he's gonna do. Now they they he had a lot of ideas himself that he wanted to play with and um <clears throat> the, the the spinning kicks were were um was one of them. And um yeah, we worked we worked a lot of stuff in uh we actually worked a lot of kickboxing in that fight because I told him, you know, one thing I'm I'm very good at is I, I analyze um, fighters, uh, you know, so I can take an opponent and say, oh, this is your future opponent. Okay, here's his tendencies. Here's where he's weakest. And, and I, I like to break people down. And I, and I broke Travis down and, and emulated Travis the best that I could in sparring. And um, gave, gave, I believe, just gave Kane the confidence to throw things because he was able to read his his um, structural patterns, you know. And, uh, yeah, Kane was doing that, doing that to me all through practice. So, uh, yeah, it wasn't a surprise. Everyone else was shocked, but it wasn't a surprise to see him do it, to be honest. Also, uh, fighting on the same card, uh, another one of your training partners there, AK and Daniel Cormier, fought Anderson Silva. And a lot of fans and media were critical of Cormier's performance despite walking away with a unanimous decision victory. Uh, do you feel that criticism was fair of Daniel? Definitely not. No, definitely not. Um, and, you know, I'd say that about anybody who had fought and had that last-minute change, had the stress of dealing with um, the change of opponent uh, so close to the fight and then still going out there and performing. Because, you know, it isn't easy. We prepared for a specific person in John Jones, and we got replaced with um, Anderson Silva. And it's two completely different fighters. They're two completely different styles. So if you're... Um, if you're, it's like taking a, a, a knife to a gunfight, you know. If you're, if you're um, capable of taking the guy down and keeping him there, then take him down and keep him there. The fans wanted to see Anderson Silva hands down, leaning against the cage kind of stuff, but you can't do that to DC because he'll just take you down. You, you're not stopping DC from taking you down. So, yeah, I think it was the most, if he, he was an intelligent fighter that night. You know, he could have been cocky and said, oh, yeah, I'm going to stand and trade with one of the best strikers the sport has ever seen. Or I'm going to take him down and I'm going to dominate him. And that's exactly what he did. He dominated the the greatest of all time in Anderson Silva. So I'm, I, I think you, you've got to congratulate the guy, you know, to take that fight, that change in such short notice and deal with all of the stress and then completely change the game plan, then um, I think you can do nothing but commend him. Now, of course, uh, you just fought here last week for Glory 32, got out relatively unscathed. How quickly would you like to be back uh, inside the Glory ring? ASAP. I would like to, to try and get on that New Jersey card if possible. We'll see. You know, we'll see what happens. But um, I've put the word out there. I've expressed that I'm, I'm very keen to, to, to keep going, keep rolling, let the hype train continue to roll. And um, hopefully my, uh, my calls will be answered. But we'll see. We'll, we'll see. My fingers are crossed. All right, he is Chai Lewis Perry. You can follow him on Twitter and Instagram at Real Chopper Chai. And Chai, thanks again for coming on the show. I really appreciate it. And I look forward to your uh, next fight later this year. Thanks. Once again, that was Glory Kickboxer Chai Lewis Perry here on Beyond the Cage. Stay tuned for more coverage of Glory 32 as I break down the main card in just a moment. Getting to the main card of Glory 32, it started in the light heavyweight division as a four-man light heavyweight tournament took place there in Virginia. Uh, looking at the first matchup, Pavel Zurilov against uh, Machada, who was a late replacement. And Ariel, this was just his uh, debut, actually, for Glory. He had uh, trained and fought um, down in Brazil, mostly. And I think they said at one point had fought former light heavyweight uh, champion uh, Saulo Kovari in an amateur match. And for uh, Pavel, also making his Glory debut, but he's fought some of the best of the best in the heavyweight and light heavyweight division over his career. 80 fights strong, came in with a record of 69-11, and despite all that experience and fighting bigger names, 
he was not impressive in his glory debut, and really this fight overall was not that great. For Ariel, of course, you know, it's his glory debut, uh, much like Pavel, but he's coming on short notice. He had no idea who he was going to face, and he's taking on a guy with a lot more experience with him, uh, despite compiling a very impressive 43-7 and seven career record. And I thought, that for the most part, kind of stayed on the outside, was landing kicks to the leg and body pretty effectively. Pavel was definitely the aggressor. He was definitely the one moving forward in this fight, but it never really seemed like he could land much significant damage or really did anything to me to really bother Ariel from getting out of that kick-heavy strategy. He really didn't do much to counter that. He wasn't checking the kicks. He wasn't grabbing them. He wasn't really doing much in the way of clinch work. And for a guy that's had a very storied career and a very good career, I thought he kind of fell flat there against Machado. And I don't know if that was trying to save something for the final or underestimating his opponent, or maybe he didn't watch a lot of tape of this guy because of the short notice. I'm not really sure what it was, but the first fight was not not really great for either guy. But Machado definitely, to me, was the land uh, was the one landing more effective strikes, and I thought um, definitely deserved the decision to move on to the final. And in the other semifinal, uh, Warren Thompson took on Zinedine Hammerlein, and as you just heard in my interview with. Uh, Chai Lewis Perry, uh, he concurred that the knockout of the night definitely belonged in favor of the Frenchman who took care of Warren Thompson, the American, in just 20 seconds in the first round. And boy, just what a huge right hand that he landed there against Thompson. And Thompson went out cold. I mean, out, out. He fell flat on the canvas and... I mean, there were some great knockouts here on this glory card, but nobody went out like that. Uh, impressive victory there for Zenedine, just 20 seconds. And um, with that victory there, I had to feel like he was uh, definitely the favorite to win at that point, having only competed 20 seconds, whereas Machado had to go you know, a full nine minutes there. And Z Hammerlane's a solid guy, you know, currently ranked eight, but he's fought current uh, interim champion uh, Zach Muikasa to a decision back at Glory 29, so the fact that he didn't get knocked out by uh, Zach there, that's something of an accomplishment in himself, so he's a guy that I think will definitely factor in uh, very well in this division, I think that will make things interesting for his rematch there uh, against Muikasa coming probably sometime later this year, and uh, for the final, of course, I'm kind of foreshadowing a little bit, and, but of course, if you saw it, you saw how the final went, and for Machada, uh, he definitely stepped up his game here in round two. Definitely was more aggressive. I think realized that Hammerlane was going to have a lot better uh, conditioning considering he only went 20 seconds, and I thought really stepped it up. I think at that point, kind of like I was saying, if he was holding back or Pavel was holding back to try to save it for the finals, if that was his strategy, I mean, it didn't quite work out, but he definitely showed a lot more, I think, in that loss than he did in his win against Pavel. And yeah, he was mixing those kicks well, but he was really uh, striking uh, heavy with his hands inside the pocket there with uh, Hammerlane, and I think that was kind of a mistake. I think he started to open up his hands more, trying to create open, trying to put Hammerlane away, not allowing this fight to get into uh, deeper waters where Hammerlane would be the better conditioned fighter, or at least assuming that he would be the better conditioned fighter. Uh, and... You know, it didn't really work out that way. Hammerlane was able to land another right hand and then countered with the knee there up against the ropes, and Machado could not continue anymore. And uh, with that overall tournament performance, Hammerlane, as I mentioned, got the knockout of the night for that knockout there against Thompson, and, and deservedly so. But he ended up also getting the fighter of the night bonus uh, to net an extra $10,000 in bonus money. And while I'm not arguing that his overall performance there was great. And I'm going to kind of side with uh, Chai here, who you just heard uh, speak. Yeah, he caught the guy with the right hand coming in sooner, but I think the overall performance he maybe could have gave to Chai, to Anderson Silva, or I think even to Giga. I think all of those were deserving of the fighter. And I think that's one thing that I wish there was like a fight of the night category, not specifically fighter, because... A guy like Zinedine basically had twice to prove that he was the best fighter that night. And I think tournaments, which 
are almost always happening at some uh, point on a glory card, whether it be the Super Fight Series or the main card now on ESPN3, those guys are going to have a huge advantage being able to fight a potential 18 minutes in one night. So I'd like to see a third category of fight of the night added as well, so that way someone that maybe was on the losing end but still put up a good performance, still made it exciting, I think gets some extra bonus money as well. So maybe something to consider, but overall I do like the bonuses. I think it's great they have them. I'm surprised it took 31 events before bonuses happened, but I, I think it's deserved. And I can't argue too much with Hammerlane, but I could kind of see that he had a little bit of advantage being able to fight uh, twice in one night. But uh, congrats to him on his uh, tournament victory there in Glory 32. And I think a rematch against uh, Zach Muicasa will be very excellent. And I probably expect that could, I would consider maybe Glory's next event for October or maybe their November event, as Muikasa didn't really take much damage uh, in his first-round knockout win to become the interim uh, champion uh, at Glory's uh, last event there for Glory 31. So excited for that, possibly Glory 34 or Glory 35. Looking at the coming events uh, of the evening there, as uh, Colette took on Myron Dennis, and this was a awesome bout and if they had a fight of the night I think I would have gave it to this matchup here uh, between uh, two Americans there and Myron Dennis and Brian Colette early on I thought Dennis was definitely doing a good job he was definitely pushing the pace it seemed like Colette was countering having a little trouble and then uh, Colette I think landed a uh, head kick if I'm not mistaken that really seemed to rattle Dennis and he ended the first round strong did Colette and that round could have went either way. I, I think the early all, early overall pressure there by Dennis probably would have gave him the uh, first round there. But then in rounds two and three, I think Dennis never really recovered from that kick. And while coming forward and being aggressive, Colette did a really good job of countering and avoiding a lot of those uh, big shots that Dennis is capable of throwing. And I thought just did a very tactical job while avoiding shots and landing big shots himself. And for Dennis, man, he's tough for hanging in there. He definitely took some shots. And, you know, he got his rematch here uh, about not, not quite a year, a little over a year against uh, Colette there. Wasn't able to do it, but put on a heck of a performance. And I think a guy that is very competitive in this light heavyweight division, I think definitely, despite the loss, can still hang around. And for Colette... Uh, obviously, it was unfortunate he couldn't compete there in the light heavyweight tournament, but I think definitely he moves up the ladder. Probably takes on uh, possibly one of those guys that lost uh, there in the tournament. Maybe a uh, Manny Mancha, uh, maybe a Morad uh, Buzidi, maybe a Salo Calvari, maybe a Gohan Saki. I mean, there's several guys that he can take on and I think would be good, but I wouldn't be surprised if Colette gets a bigger time opponent for his next fight and may only be one or two away uh, from a shot at the light heavyweight championship, of course, if he wins. The main event of the evening there for Glory 32 was for the featherweight championship, a rematch between Sergei Adamchuk and Gabriel Varga. Of course, these two uh, met, uh, I think, a little over a year ago, 18 months and that was when Varga was champion. Uh, that was back at uh, Glory 25, and that was with Adam Chuck uh, coming out the victor. Since then, he had defended his title just once, defeating the Jaguar there and, and Mosab Abrani, and then moved up on short notice to take on Mohamed El Amir at Glory 29. Now taking on Varga once again, who hadn't fought uh, in Glory since that loss for the title. And talking uh, after the fight with Todd Grisham, he kind of said that once he became champion, he kind of lost his motivation to fight, you know, considering he had beat the top, you know, he had beaten guys like Shane Oblonsky, like uh, the Jaguar Amrani, and had really been dominant in glory, you know, winning tournaments, and was able to, you know, come up short the first time, you <laughs> know. And I think it was more of a mental thing more so than it was a skill thing there against uh, Adam Chuck, who 
maybe you could say is a little more mentally strong fighter, but he's a guy that is a very consistent fighter, win or lose. You kind of know what to expect from Adam Chuck. He doesn't give you uh, a lot of room to operate. He's hard to hit. He counters a lot. His combinations are always on point. He's pretty good in the clinch. And he's just a hard guy to put away, too, because because you can't hit him. Now, the one con of his style is because of the punches and bunches and quick countering, he's not a very heavy knockout guy. So he's a guy that does allow his opponents to hang around, and that sometimes can be a bad thing. And in this matchup here against Varga, while it was a very close fight, very technical, a lot of clinching, and there was some breaking up, the scramble there that they had in the second round, kind of uh, exiting there out of the pocket, Varga was able to catch Serhei with his hands down and dropped him there. And that was pretty much the turning point of the fight, that knockdown there in the second round. And despite not being a really big knockout guy, it never seemed like Serhei was fighting like he was down. He's a guy that fights very well with the lead, but against Varga, after getting that knockdown there, heading in rounds three, four, and five, he never seemed to amp it up. He really seemed to fight at the same pace that we're used to seeing him fight. And after getting knocked down, however you want to score round one, whether you give it to him or not, he needed to do something. He needed to go big. He needed to either try to sweep all those three rounds, which I don't think he did, and or he needed a knockdown, which he didn't get. And the one judge scored it 48-48, which is how I would have scored. I would have scored it a draw um, because of the points with Adam Chuck winning. And the other two judges scored it 48-46, which I can't complain because round four to me was a really ugh, round and <laughs> could have even been scored a 9-9. I think that round was – that round and round one were – two rounds that not a lot happened and it's you can kind of make a case for both guys they were really even but they really weren't the most exciting rounds of course Varga had the knockdown in round three and I thought Serhei definitely took rounds three and five you know he did enough to win that fifth round but I didn't think it was enough to win the fight and while Varga this was not an overly dominant performance or he went in there and kicked uh, Serhei's butt or anything like that he got the win but I can't say it's lucky because he dropped him. He really did, and he definitely won rounds in this fight, even if he would have dropped him. It would have been a lot closer fight had he not gotten that. But he's still going to have to do some work to do because this wasn't that great of a performance. And I think there's other top featherweights right now that maybe are kind of chomping at the bit. Uh, I don't know if it was because of the layoff. I don't know if it was just because Adam Chuck is that good. But he's definitely going to have to amp up his performance um, in his next fight and also he's going to have to check his mental game it's something that he told with Todd Grisham that you know he's champion again how am I going to deal with this I really have to learn how to deal with this so he goes I want to take some time and figure out how to fight as a champion and I think that's also something that's a real thing for not just him but other fighters so that's something he's going to really have to adjust coming into his next fight and with a not a great performance he's going to have to up that mentally and physically uh, regardless of who he takes on next which chances are will probably be the winner of the featherweight tournament coming here at glory 33 and for adam chuck this is a learning experience for him i mean i know he's been in nearly 40 professional fights but you can't get knocked down like that especially in a five-round fight and kind of kind of coast through the next three rounds not amp it up not go for broke I think it's a lot better to lose possibly getting knocked out than by a majority decision like that. And, you know, you kind of almost hand Varga the win there. You really did nothing to take it away from him. And your only choice at – your only chance, I should say, at that point was for it to be a draw. And it wasn't – even though I scored it a draw, I, I had a feeling it wasn't going to be, that Varga did enough to get the victory. So kind of reminiscent of their first fight, which was very close as well. But if Adam Chuck wants to be champion again and a situation like that happens where he gets dropped early, he's going to, he's going to have to cha change his performance because you can't beat talented guys like that and Gabriel Varga just coasting after getting dropped. So 
Uh, real quickly, of course, I kind of already mentioned uh, about the Badr Hari fight uh, coming in December. A little bit about Glory uh, 33. I already mentioned the, the women's uh, Grand Prix continuing. Of course, Rico Verhoeven versus Anderson Silva. The featherweight tournament I mentioned a little bit. I think Adam Chuck is a guy that, if he wants to, I think should compete in that featherweight tournament. Maybe, you know, competing twice in one night. Maybe get that fire uh, back from him or something. Again, I, I thought he was kind of lacking there in that fight uh, against Varga. So I think Giga is also a shoo-in. Um, looking at some other guys, I think Amrani might just get a straight-up tile shot. I think he's good enough to just challenge Varga. But if not, I don't know if he wants to do another tournament. He's a guy I think that can win a tournament against anybody, but he's a guy I'd like to see. And also, I think Sunchai should be in the tournament as well. Uh, his win over Eddie uh, Nat Salamani was very impressive. So I wouldn't be too shocked if we see some combination of Giga, Adam Chuck, Senchai, and possibly Armrani. Uh, I think those could possibly be the four. Um, Maykal Yurk could also factor in. Shane Oblonsky could factor in as well. So we'll see, though. I, I, I think they got a lot of good featherweights on their roster, and any combination of four guys that aren't now the champion, uh, Gabriel Varga, is going to make for an interesting tournament, an exciting tournament, and definitely produce a worthy number one contender for the featherweight championship. Also, real quickly, on Glory 33, it will headline the Super Fight Series, Simon Marcus against Jason Woolness. Just want to comment on that real quickly. Pretty obvious uh, because Woolness defeated uh, Joe Schilling there, albeit controversially, at Glory 30. With the departure of Artem Levin and, of course, Marcus uh, defeating Dustin Jacoby pretty easily that night, Wilness was pretty much the obvious choice there to take on Dustin Jacoby. These two have met before with Simon Marcus defeating Jason Wilness uh, back at Glory 20 in Dubai. Uh, that was part of the tournament. So it should be interesting. I think Wilness is a solid fighter, but... Man, Simon Marcus is just, he's so good. Uh, he's so fast in this middleweight division. Uh, so its it should be interesting because I would say Willness is a little more powerful, a little bigger of a guy, but that usually has not seemed to phase Simon Marcus, not only in glory but in other organizations. But uh, definitely a great fight, uh, I think, and really the only fight to make for glory's middleweight division. And I think it's uh, an excellent fight to headline the Super Fight Series uh, for glory on the UFC Fight Pass. So... Once again, I am Jim Graham. Thank you for listening to another edition of Beyond the Cage. You can follow me on Twitter at Jim Graham. You can like Beyond the Cage on Facebook, facebook.com slash Beyond the Cage Podcast. I want to thank the chopper, Chai Lewis Perry, for coming on the show this week. Uh, nice of him to uh, chat with me for a few minutes there, and definitely a exciting guy to look forward to competing in Gloria once or twice more this year in 2016. He's uh, really looking at getting back at since his injury layoff. So. Um, Glory 32, excellent card overall. Light heavyweight tournament, uh, you know, was at the first semifinal wasn't that great, but uh, picked it up there uh, in the final and the other semifinal, and overall uh, a really good card. And a little surprised we're now going to be waiting about six, seven weeks for Glory 33. There's going to be no event in August, so that's that's a little odd. I would have liked to see an event in August and September, but the event we're getting in September is uh, very awesome. So. I look forward to that uh, back in September. So uh, once again, I am Jim Graham, and thank you for listening to another edition of Beyond the Cage.